My name is Heather Thompson. I'm the Director of Alumni Relations here at UW Superior. We are thrilled to be partnering with the Link Center and continuing ed on this project. Um, Work Your Core is a series of uh, alumni speaker events that will be happening throughout the academic year. We have three amazing alumni here to speak to you today. Um, I am going to um, introduce them really quick, um, but I'm going to let them share their stories. So you'll hear more from them about that. Uh, Trisha Bartel, or Tia? Priscilla. Priscilla, thank you. Sorry, Trisha. Um, class of 95, graduated with a major in accounting, um, works um, for Target Corp as VP and Chief Audit Executive. Thank you. John Garver, class of 98 and 2000, sports management and a master's in communication. John is the Director of Athletic Communications here at UW-Superior. And Amanda Van Kilstam, class of 2012, business administration major. Amanda is a marketing manager at Essentia Health. So Liza Shuckwist, uh, who is the career development manager here at UWS, uh, and also an alum, class of 2019, will provide an overview of the NACE competencies and today's core skills. Thanks, Heather. So hi, thanks for joining us today. My name is Liza Shuckwist. I'm the career development manager, as Heather mentioned earlier. So Essentially, I help students explore major and career paths. I can help build those core skills that we'll be talking about and they're needed in the workplace. We also connect students to jobs and internships through Career Central events. So today we'll be talking about NACE core competencies. Uh, NACE is a national association that has collected eight essential skills desired by both employers and colleges. So developing these uh, proficiency in these skills and articulating these skills will give you a cutting edge advantage when it comes to pursue further education or employment. These competencies are also kind of known as transferable skills, so that's a more popularized term, but uh, the core skills is also a synonym there. So today our fabulous alumni have returned to campus to elaborate on their experience with specifically career and self-development skills and communication skills, so two of the eight. Um, professionals who pr practice these skills proactively develop through professional and uh, personal learning, so they possess awareness in their own strengths and weaknesses. They also consistently build relationships inside and outside of one's organization. Uh, communication is clearly and effectively exchanging information and perspectives with persons inside and outside of the organization as well. So what does that mean? Sample behaviors for both skills could include but are not limited to uh, developing plans and goals for your future career, seeking out opportunities to learn about their industry, uh, voluntarily uh, participating in further education or training, also employing active listening, persuasion and influencing skills through written or verbal communication styles, and also asking appropriate questions for specific information from supervisors, specialists, et cetera. So of course, there's many more I could go on and on about, but identifying and developing your core skills, it takes time and practice. So students are always welcome to visit us at the Link Center uh, for more information. A great way to develop these skills too is attending events just like this. So thank you for being here. And now I'll hand it over to our alumni to uh, show more ways to embody these core skills. All right, so we'll just uh, take turns here and we'll start with Trish. Um, Trish, um, can you begin by sharing uh, about your education and career path, um, really what experiences led you to this moment in your career? Thanks. Um, so um, as you mentioned, Trish Bartella, today I work at Target, so corporate environment in Minneapolis. 
Um, grew up in northern Wisconsin up here, so came to UWS at the time. It was the school that I could go to because it's what I could afford when I worked through jobs and could make it happen. Um, I actually came to school thinking I was going to be an elementary education teacher, and not because I thought I would be good at that, but because I grew up um, surrounded by some moms who did that. I lived on a lake in northern Wisconsin, and it was cool. Everybody got to send the dogs. So I'm going to do that. It only took me a very short a number of days uh, as I got here to say, I am not good at any of the things that I would need to be good at to be an elementary education teacher. Um, but I was really good at accounting in high school. And so I'm like, I need to switch to accounting. Um, and so like that moment of knowing strengths, knowing what things are going to bring you joy and where your passion can sit, but also knowing the things that you're not great at. Um, help start the path that has been a foundation for many, many decisions along the way in my career. Um, I've been at Target for almost my whole career. So I worked for about a year and a half at a very small company in White Bear Lake, Minnesota, and then moved to Target, wanted a place where I could grow, wanted a place where I could um, balance my life outside of work. So I didn't, didn't want to do public accounting work 80 hours a week. Um, I wanted to go to work and I wanted to grow and enjoy what I did, but I also wanted to enjoy my own time. Um, and I've been there for 27 years. Um, so various financial reporting and accounting roles, got my MBA at the University of Minnesota in the Twin Cities um, because I wanted to lead and grow, um, which was a great decision. And then um, spent some time in our financial planning and analytics space. And then the last 10 years, kind of took a career change um, and moved over to internal audit. Um, and it's a little bit funny because if you'd asked me when I was leaving, UWS, where I thought I would be, that type of role was not the role I thought I would do. Um, I actually got an internship at Minnesota Power when I went to school here, and I was so excited about it. I'm like, get an internship, you're going to get a job. Um, and I got the one in internal audit instead of financial reporting, and I was like, I don't know what that is, but it was kind of fun. Um, got there, and they said, great to come intern. No roles are going to be available because we have a hiring freeze. And so like, I started right off the bat, like, I'm going to have to find a different path. Um, so, you know, fast forward to about 10 years ago when I was asked to um, jump into the internal audit space at Target, um, I was like, huh, I don't really have any experience in that, but it has been an amazing job. Um, and just one more role where I've been able to bring the skills that I bring to bear, the strengths that I have, but also um, not the places where I need to surround myself with other people that do things well that I don't. So that's me. <laughs> My name again is Amanda von Kilsdong. Um, so I graduated from UWS in 2012, and it was my third college I went to for undergrad. So I transferred quite a few times until I got here. Um, and I'll just say when I was a senior in high school, I felt very forced from like family and just how it was then that I had to pick a major when I started college. So I went in as biochem to be a doctor my first year. And was very sad about it, but it killed me. <laughs> um, I tried, I tried. So then I went um, to a different school the following year. Um, and I decided I'm going undecided. You know, I, I learned my lesson the first time. I did all these courses in bio, like biochem. I'm not doing it. And so during that time, I got to experiment a lot. So I went to a liberal arts college before that, which was really helpful. And it was just like, you know, told myself, it's okay not to know. So by the time I ended up here, you know, was my third year, and I totally followed one of my brothers here, um, I decided, okay, I think I'm liking business. And I, and I was like, that's as good as I can get right now. Um, so I came here, and I started taking business courses, and that's where I started getting really my groove, and I found a passion for marketing. Um, so I graduated as a yeah, five-year senior. Um, I did get to study abroad, so I'll give that plug. Um, but I... Um, majored in this, uh, business administration with a concentration in marketing. Um, and if anything, anybody knows anything about marketing, it's a very hard area to find to find jobs in. Um, it's very um, challenging. So I was very fortunate that when I worked pretty much, the, I was just saying that a couple of days after I graduated, I actually got a marketing specialist role, the only one here at the time at UWS. And so it was just like meant to be. And I held that role for four years. And during that time, I just, I loved the school again, loved the people, but I was ready for, I think the next challenge. And I would known for many years, I had still had this passion for healthcare. So not gonna be a doctor, I chickened out of that, but I was like, healthcare is like still in my blood, my family is all in it. So I started applying for jobs at the local, one of the local healthcare systems here called Essential Health. 
Um, I applied for four jobs. I had probably over 20 interviews, denied, denied, denied. Finally, I got my foot in as they created a new job there for marketing specialists. So it's like starting out at ground level and I took it. Um, so since then, I've been with Essentia for nine years. I've been marketing specialist. I moved then up to a marketing planner one, to a marketing planner two, to a East marketing manager, to now the corporate marketing manager. And that's um, been really, really, really fun. Um, just to watch not only the organization grow and change, um, but to have the new challenges within just, you know, healthcare and marketing. And it's just been a wild ride. Um, but very fortunate, again, it, it all started from not only going to school here, but having that jumping stone as, as a marketing specialist at Essentia to get me where I'm at today. So, yeah. And I'm John Garber. I am the Director of Athletic Communications here at EW Superior. Uh, I graduated in 1998 with an undergraduate degree in an individualized major. I created my own major here. Uh, so sports management with my Bachelor of Science, and then I went right into graduate school and got my master's degree in mass communications. Um, you went to three schools, I only went to two. I started at the University of North Dakota, and then I transferred here. And it was anything but a linear path to, to get where I am today. I, I changed my major three times. Uh, like Amanda, I kind of felt pressured a little bit to have an idea of what I was going to do, and my dad was an accountant, so when I first went to school, I was, was an accounting major, and then I realized I really didn't like it that much. Uh, the math was fine, but I just thought it was, no offense, boring. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'm going to try something else, and then when I transferred here, I was a business major, and that was okay, but I wasn't loving it, so then I decided to be a biology major, and I was going to go to school to be an optometrist, and that was fine until I got into chemistry, and I had problems in chemistry class, so I was like, okay, I got some real problems here because now I'm a sophomore, and I'm running out of ideas, and one of my teammates said to me, you know what you should try, because it's kind of where your skill set is, and he, can, he, he was in the individualized major program as well, so that's what I did, and ended up really enjoying being able to create my own curriculum and sort of follow the path that I created for myself, which was really kind of cool. Um, then I graduated and wanted to, at that time I was thinking I was going to be a coach and you had to have a master's degree to be a coach. So I went into graduate school, went with the comm major because it was the quickest one and I could be out in two years. And while I was doing that, I was doing some coaching and then my coach at the time said, you've got some skills with speaking and writing and, and this communication stuff. You should really think about that instead. Okay, so you're saying I'm a lousy coach. Got it. <laughs> so I kind of took that to heart a little bit, and then he left and went and ran a hockey league and hired me to be his communications intern, and that was kind of the springboard from there. I got my first job in the hockey industry from that internship that I had with him, and then after a couple of years working in the United States Hockey League, I came back to campus and ran the arena for a couple of years. And then I left again and went back to the United States Hockey League. And my boss retired. They hired a new commissioner. He called all of us into the office one day and said, as of this day, you don't have a job anymore. So there was this wave of terror that kind of broke over me. And I thought, well, okay, in panic mode, I just grabbed the first thing that I, I could. And that was selling insurance. Awesome career for some people, great income potential. For me, it was the worst thing in the world. It was a terrible career decision. And I was at in a point where, okay, I'm gonna, I was done with that and didn't know what I was going to do. Had a job lined up in the hockey world again, and then a mutual friend of ours, Tom, uh, the chairman of the board, Dr. Erlenbach, called me one day and said, I have an idea. Come and see me. And he cre basically created the job that I have now. We didn't have any full-time people in this position. And he basically created the position and said, we'll test this out for a year. If it works, we'll go through the search process and then away we go. And now I'm in my 14th year in this position. So it's mm -hmm. it was anything but linear. There was a lot of zigs and zags and peaks and valleys. But at the end of the day, I think I found where I was supposed to be and where my skills, you know, where my strengths were and, you know, worked out really well. I'll have you hold on with the mic. Nice. I think they're going to figure out pick this up. So. so students get excellent practice <laughs> communicating in the college setting. 
Um, what are some of the best communication skills students can develop right now that will serve them in the workplace? Whenever I talk to students, I tell them, learn to write. One of the biggest skills I was able to pick up was learning how to write. Every job you apply for says you must have excellent written communication skills, excellent verbal communication skills. You have to know how to write. It comes with writing a cover letter. When I'm on a hiring committee, if you don't write a good cover letter, you don't move forward. You have to be able to write. You have to be able to communicate with the written word. How did I do that? I, I joined the school paper. And I will go back and look at the old issues of the Prometheus and look at some of this in fact, it was terrible. <laughs> but you have to start somewhere. And so learn how to write, put yourself in a position where you can do those kinds of things. Learn how to talk to people. And I think that's something that we've really lost over the last 15 to 20 years. People can't talk anymore. They'll text you all day long. I actually had an employee one time say, if you're going to fire me, just do it on email or text message. I don't want to talk about it. You have to know how to talk to people. Put yourself in positions where, yeah, you are going to be a little uncomfortable. A lot of people don't want to sit up here with a microphone in their hand and talk to people. They don't want to public speak. They don't want to have to do those things, but they're very, very important. If you're in a job interview, you're going to have to talk to people. You're going to have to sit across the desk with them and have an actual conversation. You have to know how to, how to, you have to have those skills. You have to know how to build those skills. And I made sure that I put myself in a position in college where, yeah, I didn't always enjoy it. It wasn't always comfortable, but five years, 10 years, 20 years later, it's all served me very, very well. So I think the biggest things that I picked up when I was a student here that I think transfer were transferable were absolutely the, the written and oral communication skills. Those are the biggest things to me. You hit on a lot of my points. <laughs> you should have had the mic first. <laughs> I saw that coming. Um, what I can expand on though is also just to for even everything John said 100%, but for today's day and age, again, now we look back for past four years, previously everything was in person. So keeping up your communication skills was like really easy because everything was face to face. So it didn't take practice, it was there. Now, and we were talking about this, there's a lot of remote and there's a lot of hybrid and it's a completely different world. And it's real, you're really starting to see that in job interviews. Um, and so I, I think if I could give feedback for anybody who is, doing virtual classes right now, anybody who's looking at careers that could be remote or hybrid is your remote presence. Um, because we've, had, I've seen people be, like other organizations be fired for things like that. And that means, and I would say even practicing in class, keep your camera on, don't turn it off. Um, at my organization, you're not allowed to have your camera off. So you could have 27 meetings a day, it's on for every one of them. Um, the other thing is, it's just sort of like, and now it's like computer etiquette. So um, while you're in the conversations, again, virtually, and I'll keep to this because I know John here really well, um, in person and written communication, but remote is always be present. Again, I think a lot of that step one, have your camera on. I think you're instantly forced to be present because you know there's people watching you. So that helps a ton. But it's also then listening because a lot of people that, They'll have it on, and then when there's need for discussion or feedback, it's crickets. Well, that you can't get anywhere in any industry with that kind of style of that communication. You won't move up. You won't. It's just you need to interact. So it's a lot easier to remotely. Again, you're not. You don't have the uncomfortability of face to face. So whenever I would say that my biggest feedback would be if you do have any virtual classes right now start a practice of having your camera on and being interactive, having the eye contact, even through the screen. And I know it's just like such a, again, it's just so weird to talk about it like that, but it's not going to change. If anything, it's things are going to become more and more remote. Again, there are industries that are international. So you have to work with teams in other countries at different time zones. And that's a huge respect that factor in other countries for sure. Um, that America, like here in the U.S., we really struggle with. It's just whatever you do in person that has to reflect remotely as well. So it's not two different people. You have to have it on both sides. Um, I would say two great components of foundations, right? Like grit and oral communication is the ticket for everything. It's how you get in the door. It's how you're going to be successful every day. Um, and then I love the call out. It's about what that looks like. I know it's different here. 
I spend a lot of time with my team talking about how you use all the things we just talked about here as a foundation um, in different ways. And so one of those is just the ability to influence. And so you influence because you yourself can communicate well and you can get to a story and you can get to the summarized point and you can help people understand your perspective. But you also listen, you said it, right? Like knowing your audience, knowing and putting yourself in their shoes so you can tailor what you're saying and how you're saying it and how you're bringing things to bear becomes really critical if you want to get to the end game of influencing somebody to do something that they don't want to do, whether that's hire you in an interview, we you know, bring you in for an interview through a cover letter, or in a business setting where you want them to do something that you're driving through your work. Um, all that is super important. The other thing I would say is how you can think and speak on your feet as you have that solid foundation and can use it more effectively over time. Um, we are in a society where everything is so fast paced and if you only have 25 minutes in a meeting, you may not have time to really ponder and think. And so you've got to be able to get your point of view out there, listen and hear things, and then react and think quickly and get the next thing out right when you need to um, so that you can drive what you want to get to. And so I would um, think that kind of rounds out the number of things around communication. Well, sticking with communication, <laughs> um, in your current <laughs> professional role, Tell us about a time that someone impressed you with their communication about an issue. What about their approach was unique? Um, so in my role today, um, basically an internal audit team goes out and meets with business partners and understands what processes and controls to help people be successful towards their objectives. Um, and in a lot of cases, we are influencing people to fix gaps or fix things if they're not um, built the way you want them to be seen. And a lot of times, people are defensive about that, right? Which you know, naturally you are. Somebody tells you the things that you're doing isn't the way it should be done. Um, I have a senior director on my team who just has an amazing knack of being able to start a story at a very high level. Like, here's what we were coming in to see. Here's what I saw. Here's what I think needs to be different. And here's why. And in a very short period of time, getting the person sitting across from them, like on board with what they're hearing, that then you can go deeper, right? I think if I think about the flip of that, um, if you were to say like, when people fail in that, it's when you start talking and you immediately take this idea and you're all the way down in the weeds before you've even gotten somebody on board. It's what you might want them to take away from this conversation and they are already lost, right? Um, and so that ability to summarize, that ability to know what's going to be most important to the person across from you, and she just does it in a phenomenal way, and her ability to do it in various situations, which takes a little bit of practice outside of the room, right? Like, you can't just assume that I've got great oral written skills, so I can show up anywhere and do it well. Like, that takes practice over time, and being thoughtful about the situations that you're in, practicing sometimes, right? Like, in front of a mirror, maybe even. Um, that helps you see how you're going to come across to the other person. That can help you be even more influential um, and more successful in your share. Um, I think from I think from that standpoint, uh, people I serve with that really emulate is just some of my current senior leaders that I work with. Um, in my role, I think again we have many meetings a day, and it's marketing's changed a lot. Since I even went to college, it's now so data driven and so strategic and everything, every little thing you do, you have to back it up by data. You have to back it up right by results and benchmarking. And so what that causes is when you work with like hundreds of positions and senior leaders, they're nitpicking everything. Um, they're always coming in very passionate about this is my, you know, I this is the care I provide. I need to like, we need to be doing this. And so what I've been trying to really emulate is people I've known in the industry a long time who have it's the confidence and the sincerity where you come in and you have to act as an expert. Um, if you don't, it's like, like in, I think in a lot of different scenarios, it's like blood in the water. If they don't tell that you're confident, they know that they probably can't trust you to get the job done, to help them meet their needs and all of those things. But there is the, the balance of having confidence, but when they you start getting pushback on strategy or ideas and things like that, that you don't fold, not fold, but like have that instant sort of defensive reaction. Um, when things that you're getting judged for your work or anything like that, it's being able to take a step back and always saying, okay, where are they coming from? Obviously there's something else here. So it's just that ability to be confident but sincere to listen through and to understand, okay, they're, they're 
might be a rookie and a part of strategy, but there's probably a reason why. Um, and if there is, that's probably, it could be a valid point. How do we come together? So I really look towards some of these leaders I've learned from of they don't, they don't overpromise. They are confident, but they're still sincere in the work they do and how they treat people. I, I love the word confidence that you use and actually made me switch gears in my mind where I was going to go with this. Um, when I, I first got hired in the United States Hockey League in 2001, a week after I got hired, we had league meetings and I had to sit in the room and make a presentation to the ownership group. And it was, it was a very uncomfortable situation. And my, we got done with that. And my boss pulls me aside and his, you know, two pack a day raspy voice goes, Johnny, those guys ate you for lunch. <laughs> and I kind of, mm -hmm, you know, and I've been here a week. I don't know any of them. And he just kind of sent me to the wolves there. He's like, you got to have confidence in this room because blood in the water. They knew it and they just, they took me to the cleaners. And so he sort of took me under his wing and this taught me, this is how you speak with confidence. This is how you make a presentation with confidence. And I, I pulled off of that pretty much every single day since I first started started working for the man. And some of the things that he taught me are what I try to, but I oversee student workers now. And so what I try to teach some of my students, so this is how you're gonna have, have handle a situation, especially if you're one of my supervisors, some things are gonna happen sometimes. And uh, for example, I had a student call me 11 o'clock on Saturday night and go, we're off by $150 in the money bank. And that's not a small amount of money at a school like this. So I would, we, okay, let's, we figured it out. But the way that that student handled that situation, I was actually kind of impressed with because very uncomfortable. They're under the impression that they're going to have to come up with $150. And the way that, that that person handled it, I was like, wow, that, you show a lot of confidence in that situation. I'm really proud of, of how you did that. You know, you you're, you you could be a supervisor someday. And the rewarding thing was, well, I was comfortable. I was okay because we worked on some of that kind of stuff before. So I, I go back to my first boss and how he kind of taught me how to handle some of those situations after he threw me to the walls. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes that's what it takes, though, yeah. too. I mean, it depends on the person, but... Mm -hmm. Biggest learning that way. Yeah, yeah. biggest learning come from those moments. No, it, it, you're <laughs> right. So, I mean, you learn to swim yeah. by being thrown off the dock, and they say swim, you know. So, I, yeah. So, a natural crossover between career and self development and communication is networking. How do you initiate professional connections with colleagues and industry peers? And what modalities do you use to keep in touch with those? with those folks um and modalities to share your professional accomplishments so a couple couple different parts let me know if you need me to repeat that <laughs> I, I think one of the things that i learned is just don't be afraid to approach people you know, we, you know in the sports industry there's a lot of very big personalities in those rooms that you go into and you just don't be afraid to approach them. It doesn't matter if they're, you know, the owner of a team or they are a very public figure in the media or whatever. Don't be afraid to approach those people. Have a conversation with them. Ask them if you can reach out to them. Ask them if you can have questions, if you can have a conversation with them sometime. Uh, that has served me very well. I don't know how they I mean, have their own feedback on that, but that's always been something that's just served me well. Don't be afraid to talk to people. Don't be afraid to walk up to someone. Don't be afraid to say, can I get your phone number so if I have a question I can that can bounce something off of you. And that, that served me extremely well. How do we stay in touch? Technology is great. And you have text message groups, you have email groups, social media is very good for that kind of thing too, because we're always throwing out, hey, this is our latest marketing thing that we are doing. This is our latest promotion. And it's amazing how many of people that I'm affiliated with will look at that and say, that's a really good idea. Where did you come up with that? Or I know where you came up with that idea. You stole that from me. So. It's uh, the technology piece is great, but allowing, at least in my field, to be able to stay in touch with people, exchange ideas, and, and just kind of see the, the next thing that's coming down the road. How about sharing your professional accomplishments? I'm not sure I have any. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a man. <laughs> professional accomplishments. Boy. I still have a job, so I guess I'm doing something right. <laughs> And I think maybe what this is getting at, and Liza, please, um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but 
you know, do you use, do you share those on LinkedIn? Are there other, uh, you know, other social media sites where you might, you know, kind of, um, where you might use those to, you know, kind of brag about yourself? And John, you mentioned social media is also a really great platform to share and exchange ideas. Do you ever use alternative methods? Like, I mean, of course, LinkedIn's a good example, but even alternative things like Facebook or Instagram, do you utilize that in a professional sense at all? Yeah, absolutely, I do. Absolutely, I do. Yeah, we, you know, we, we pretty much all the social media platforms. I would, I have friends on and followers on all of those that I've worked with at some point or in some capacity. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm not afraid to use any of the social media platforms if it's a chance for me to better myself or advance myself professionally. So, yeah, absolutely, I have no problem using any social media channels. Awesome. Technology is great for that. I mean, we've come a long way since the fax machine. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to start with that question because I know we're going to forget it. I'm, I feel like I have one thing I could share there. Um, I don't, I, I do mine selfishly in a sense where, for instance, um, while I was going to, when I, when I started at Essentia, I also started my MBA. Um, and so I did get a double MBA at St. Scholastica during that time. And I selfishly did that so I could move up in my industry. So in, while I might not have done, you know, I didn't post pictures and post it on social media when I got my cap and gown, but it was more if I'm doing it, I want to show, like, what? how can I kill two birds with one stone? So I'm going to put all this energy in getting an MBA. Why? Yes, I love to learn all those things, but how is this going to help me in career advancement? So similarly, I serve on um, several boards. So one of them is um, Northland Newborn Foundation in the Duluth. Um, why that, like people have asked why that over all the other organizations. I said, because my top or our top NICU providers are our top physicians and OB are there. And I want to create a stronger relationship with them. So yes, my be seen as selfish, but it's a way I can not only further my career and my professionalism, but I can also from a career standpoint of where I am, build off of that. So create those stronger connections and like, continue on up with my career and things like that. Um, the first question was, I know was how do you answer. initiate professional connections with oh. colleagues and industry peers? Which you, you kind yeah. of answered, but any other besides boards? Yeah, so I still continue um, to take like uh, certification courses and, and I think in every industry there are associations. So in healthcare marketing, there's the SHISHMED, which is the International Healthcare Marketing Association. Um, and so you can actually take very specific courses within that to continue your education, to keep up with healthcare industry standards, changes in what's coming through the pipeline, changes in marketing and, and things like that. So that's been really helpful. Um, and within it, there is a board. And so the class that you graduate with, so I did do a full semester course or two semester course there, you have then interconnections. And so now I have chief marketing officer, like friends that like people way above me in the industry that I can talk with to learn, how are you doing it at Mayo Clinic? How are you doing it at Johns Hopkins? Um, what are you learning? What are some of the battles? And people are very open because everybody in a lot of industries that are struggling right now. So we're all trying to learn from each other and grow and things are changing so quickly. So unless we can sort of back each other up, we all, we, we're gonna be stuck in the dark ages with health. Healthcare has always been a little bit behind the times sometimes. So it's been really helpful there. Um, I'll start with building network and Target as a company, super development focused, very network focused. And so I've got 27 years of like an emphasis being put on, it's okay to grab 30 minutes and just to get to know you. Like people aren't looking at that as you're slacking on your job when you're just off getting copy and meeting people. Um, and so taking advantage of that throughout my career has been super impactful and important for me. What's been interesting is as people are coming into the workforce today, like trying to get them to see the value of that, both for themselves, but also that the people they're reaching out to actually are welcoming that, right? Like, I mean, people often say, why do they want to spend 30 minutes with me? And I'm like, well, they were in your seat, you know, not that long ago. And somebody did that for them. And like, remember that. Well, I don't, what am I going to talk about for 30 minutes? Well, talk about who you are and what you want to do and ask them questions and learn from them. People like to share about themselves. And so building those networks that then people can tap back into is um, been a huge part of my career over time. And then trying to instill that in people coming in. 
Um, it's also different in a virtual world, right? Like I think a lot easier to say you want to meet downstairs and we'll take a walk and grab a cup of coffee. Then you want to jump on a Zoom call and now I'm gonna so like we've been trying to find different ways to do that in different ways. We've done like speed dating events or where you bring a bunch of people together and say, let's take advantage of that moment um to create that kind of an environment because I think it's really important. Um I don't know that I would say I use social media or other things to brag about my own professional accomplishments, but what I do is talk a lot about what our team is doing in order to engage with people that might want to be a part of our team. And I do that through a lot of industry forums. So there's an Institute of Internal Auditors as an example, and we sponsor events with people that we call the rising stars. And it's people that are just either coming right out of college or are newly in roles. And it's a great way to engage them with people that are more experienced in the profession. And so building that network for them, but also for us to meet um, people in different places. Um, at my level, I am a part of a couple of different groups where I basically engage with people that have my job and other companies and so similar to what we were talking about. Um, and one of them is, is specifically with people that aren't my competitors. So if I'm Target, I'm not there with Walmart and other retailers, but I'm there with um, Delta Airlines, right? And so we're not creating trade secrets, but we are talking about how we're hiring our teams, how things are evolving and changing in the world that we're living in how we need to be thinking differently about how we lead. And that's all just great ways for me to professionally learn as well. And so I try to get people on my team to do that same sort of thing. Like how do you find your tribe of people that you can really tap into and be vulnerable in the things that you want to learn and where you want to grow such that you can tap into others that have to do that. Did any of the three of you attend conferences as a student when you were here? Or was that not quite a as big of a thing, maybe when I did not. Okay. I, did not. I think that our students today have maybe a few more opportunities um, than than what you might have. <laughs> I did not say it all. <laughs> um, okay, I'll say so <laughs> so uh, here's the last couple of questions for you. Um, so how have you exercised your competencies in self-development and communication throughout your career journey? And then I'm going to, I'll stop there and I'll ask the next one after. Okay. So exercise your competencies. So that career development, communication, leadership, teamwork, you know, all, all of those eight competencies, um, throughout your career journey. Well, I think, and I'm sure everybody, you try and pull that in with every new experience, whether it's a job or a different education, you're pulling that with you um, your entire life. So I think that's just ongoing. I think you start leaning on different pillars at different points in your life. So right now, and I think um, we are all sort of talking to this, we're all in roles where currently where we have team, like teams below us. And so that's sort of been new over the last few years for me, where I have a full team that is looking out for me for direction, for leadership. And so that pillar of leadership and communication, those two are huge for me because I need to build them to be successful, not only within our organization, but for themselves. So that if they want to go farther, if they want to do more, that they, they're they getting the training and the support they need to get there. So I would say those, I think it all sort of changes amounts. I think you can't do it all 100%, but it just depends on where you're at in your journey and what your real focus could be on at that time. Um, I'm going to play off of the foundation I get at work because um, we have a pretty robust process around talent development and change and annual performance reviews. And part of that is development. And so we have pillars around leadership and communication and all the behaviors that we want to see. And so you're, there's a process in place whereby you're assessing yourself and you're being assessed and you can be thinking about, how do I want to grow in the year ahead? And then that growth can come from conversations about, I want to get a different experience. And so that might be a different goal. That might be taking on a project because, gosh, I want to work on communicating effectively and really influencing, and I don't get that in my day job. And so could I take on a project and do that? And that's played out over my career for sure. Um, and then that plays out with my team, right? And so like it's that conversation, and not a lot of it comes back 
to the awareness of the things that you're really good at and the uh, vulnerability to be able to talk about the things you places you want to grow. Um, and I will say over time, um, that's hard, right? Some people look at and you start to say, gosh, there's this thing I don't do well. And that immediately becomes a uh, negative. And it doesn't have to be, right? I mean, it can be that just the even better if is I want to do it better. Um, and so how do you think about, again, experiences or different roles or different places that you can grow in that? Um, and how do you tap into whether it's, you know, I want to go back to school and do something or I want to tap into a conference because, I mean, there's a ton of um, conference um, solutions that are out there and ways that you can attend things that put structure around very specific skills you want to be building. Um, and don't be afraid to look into those and ask for help um, in those spaces as well. I think Amanda really hit the nail on the head with it depends where you are in you, in your life and in your career. Because when you first start, it's like trying to drink from a fire hose. I mean, it's just you're being bombarded with information and being bombarded with knowledge. And you have to try to figure out how to retain all of that. And then things settle down a little bit. And that's when you can kind of start to evaluate, okay, where do I want to go? What do I want to do? So I think it really does depend on, on where you are in your life. And I know for me, being part of, of certain organizations has really helped me develop professionally. And then suddenly you find yourself in a position where you have to be a leader where all of you know you, okay, now you're in charge of this committee or for the first time this year, I have a full team of people underneath me. My boss said, you have a team now. How are you going to coach this? I'm like, well, when I was in grad school, my old coach told me I was a bad coach and told me I should be a great team. So I don't know how to coach this. But you end up getting into those situations where, okay, now I, I, I have a little more time to focus and how am I going to take everything that I've learned and, and move it to a new level? And so I, I think it really truly does depend on, on where you are. And just to follow up with that. So employers, we hear often that um, these are the skills that they need our graduates to have or to have an understanding of you know, when they're going out into the workforce, they can teach the hard skills, right? But this is something that needs to be, you know, built in. So, you know, I guess any any other thoughts on that? Um, you know, why, what can we tell students? Why is that so important for them to, to know about these eight core competencies? Because you use them every single day. In every every part of life, you're going to end up using those skills. So I, I think you have to find a way to, you know, it's it's like working out. I mean, you you're not going to build the muscle if you're not going to do it. So you, you have to find a way to use those skills every single day and find a way to sharpen those skills every single day. So when you get into that position where you actually get, you know what you what you're doing, and you, you know you do those things. It's okay not to know what you're doing at first. It's all right. Like I said, you're drinking from a fire hose, so it's okay. But eventually, you do have to know, and that's where all this comes from. Is you have to be able to use those those core core skills because you use them in every single aspect of your career. I second that. Um, <laughs> I also think, especially, it just seems so different. The transparency of I can see into what my my team's doing every second of the day, and so if. I can see if they're taking, you know, it's just, I think we have to be held accountable that what might have been, oh, I can, I don't have to communicate that or documentation and eh, nobody's going to find out about it. It's so much more transparent now. And so it's so easy to, to get behind. Um, and so that's an area I, I definitely struggle with my own team on is, is just having the follow through the documentation because again, I think that's a, a small piece within the communication realm um but it's so critical when every industry is moving so fast um you have like you're saying 30 minutes a meeting you could have 30 meetings a day so if you can't communicate if you can't be on top of stuff and document it you're going to get left behind so all those key pillars are very important and they're happening at such a quicker rate that it, it has been before so it's just you're always on your toes. So I think, and I'm still learning them every day. I, everybody makes mistakes all the time. Um, but it's also good to have people around to call you out when you're, when you're making the mistakes too. 
think the other thing I would add is success has to be both a combination of the what you've done. And so if you think about technical skills you're learning, I can do the accounting, I can get the numbers written down, I can do whatever with the how you get it. And like the success is only if you're going to look for those. And the how is all the skills we're talking about here. It's how you show up, it's how you communicate, it's how you lead, it's how you engage, it's how you influence. Um, and frankly, like in our company, you can't be successful if all you have is outcomes, but you do it in a way that isn't um, meeting people where they are and communicating in an effective way and actually bringing people along. It just isn't an option. Um, and I think more and more in all companies, that's the way it is. And so the balance of both that what and how is more important than ever and more continue. Any questions for our panel? Last thought. I have a question. Amanda, in your last few comments, you mentioned making mistakes. And we all know we learn probably more from our mistakes than anything that we're doing correctly. Do you have any mistakes that like pop into your mind that really you know you will never make again? And uh, for all of you, and and what happened? I mean, were they horrible, or was it just? Yeah, I don't know if you can speak on on that. Um, I just think back to my first year at Essentia. Again, you're drinking from a fire hose when you're starting a new job or anything, and they really they they want you drinking from it, and they want you to learn your own lessons, which is good. You 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 learn really quickly. Um, but I think one of the biggest, they made it twice, um, <laughs> so I really learned from it a year later, um, is when you have a meeting, um, make sure not only are you prepared, but the right people at the meeting. So whether that is you have the right operations team involved, um, you have the right physicians, you just want to make sure you have the right people involved, because if you get too far down the pathway and the right stakeholders aren't there, it will implode. The other piece, the other example is if you don't have your the right team to back you up in a meeting, you could <laughs> be in a very bad spot sometimes. So I just think of times when I didn't think, okay, prepare enough to think of what, what do you need to know to go into that meeting so everything can move smoothly. Um, those are big hits for me <laughs> when I think back. I agree 100% on preparation. Going back to college, and you, you're going to do, a, you're supposed to do a speech, and you don't prep for it at all, and then all of a sudden you stand in front of the room, and you know, they want to take it on Is that you missed the point completely? Um, I did that once in college, and I did it once in a meeting too, and my, my former boss saying to me, man, this isn't going to work if you're not going to put the time in and take the steps that you have to do beforehand. So, Preparation 100%. And even sometimes when you're fully prepared, it doesn't work. We could be spoiling up and ask some people's hands on a graduation. So, you know, even when you are prepared, so many of those mistakes. We don't want to think about that. Just think about what I was saying because I'm not going to love them in my mind. I think I love the prepared piece for certain. Um, I think the other thing is, um, like I talked a lot about vulnerability today, and I think um, like being curious allows you to be vulnerable because you can ask questions when you don't know things, and it's not like you're saying I don't know what's going on, but that curiosity helps you learn in different ways. Um, and a couple of I would say maybe my bigger mistakes in my career have been those places where I assume that the person across from me either. Did all the things that they said they were going to do, went as far or as deep as they maybe should have, they made decisions on something off of those, that information and that data. And had I asked any more questions, they probably wouldn't have made that decision. And I look back. And so over my career, I have gotten more and more curious and every role that I'm in. And I ask a ton of questions. And sometimes people talk to like, hey, ask so many questions. Um, so I also find myself telling people sometimes, like, but this is who I am, and I'm asking because I'm seeking to understand, and I'm asking because I'm curious, I'm asking because I want to learn, versus I'm asking because I'm feeling what I'm doing. Um, but ultimately, in doing it, and you learn the moment they're doing, and you can first correct. Um, and I would say, absolutely, those are moments I learn the most because, like, it seems to be in these situations, so like, oh, if only. So, how do I do a difference?
Um, I'm check okay. so, mm -hmm. Trish, Amanda, Don, thank you so much for being here. Um, we will share your expertise uh, with as many students as we possibly